Like the lowly Jesus, no, not one, no, not one. None else could heal all our souls' diseases, no, not one, no, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles, he will guide till the day not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one, no, not one. No friend like him is so high and holy. No, not one, no, not one. And yet no friend is so meek and lowly. No, not one. knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. Was there a gift like the Savior given? No, not one, no, not one. Will he refuse saints a home in heaven? No, not one, no, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day. No, not one, no, not one. Let's turn to number 11, number 11. Angry words, so oh, let them never from the tongue unbridled slip. May the heart's best impulse ever check them ere they soar the lip. Love one another, blessed the Savior. Children, obey the Father's blessed command. Savior, children obey the 
Father's blessed command. Love one another, thus saith the Savior. Children, obey the blessed The song before our prayer this evening will be number 232. Number 232. I'm not sure I've ever led this one before, so it may need some help. The Lord's my shepherd, I'm not one. God, we thank you for this beautiful day that you've blessed us with. We thank you for the sunshine and for the rain and for all the things that you do for us daily. We're thankful for this opportunity again to come together and hear thy word proclaimed. We pray that you might be with Brother Chad and bless him with a good remembrance of the things he has prepared to say to us. Thank you for Jesus Christ who went to the cross for our sins, for the cruel death that he endured uh, for the suffering and pain and agony. We pray that you'll be with us every day in our lives. We pray that you'll bless us to live the kind of life that we should before our fellow man. Heavenly Father, we're saddened by the things that our government has passed about marriage, about abortion, about many things that man says is right, but in your sight is wrong. We pray that you'll help us to take a stand in our lives to defend the faith when we have, have the opportunity. We pray for all the military personnel, men and women throughout the world that are protecting our country. Also, we pray for the men and women that are in law enforcement that protect and serve this great nation as well. We pray that you might be with them and bless them. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our elders, for the good work that they are doing in leading us. We pray for the articles that Brother Chris mentioned this morning that will be in the new local newspaper. We pray that much good will come from this. We pray that you might go with us now through the remainder of this service and on through whatever future life you see fit to give us. Finally, in the end, if we've been found faithful, 
We ask for that home with thee. In Christ's name, amen. The song of invitation at the proper time will be number 214. Number 214. And the song before uh, Brother Chad comes this evening will be number 166. Number 166. And I invite you to stand if you would like and if you're able to. Oh, worship the King of glory as above and gratefully sing His wonderful love. Our shield and defender, the ancient of days, the pavilion in splendor and girded. It breathes in the air, it shines in the light, it streams from the hills, it descends to the plain, and sweetly distills in the dew and the be back here this evening. I, I forgot to mention it this morning, but we would uh, certainly appreciate prayers over the next few days and especially tomorrow morning and Friday night as we're uh, traveling to Tennessee to Camp McCroy with uh, 13 of our young folks from Bremen and another, let's see, four, five, six, seven, eight uh, Eight, yes, t eight total from Villarica as well. So we've got uh, several folks going up there. Uh, we always look forward to that. It's very exhausting, uh, but but a lot of uh, a lot of fun as well. And uh, also, I don't I don't know uh, any anything more. But uh, Reagan was just telling me a few minutes ago that uh, she had heard about a counselor on the way to Horizons. A count you did say a counselor, right? Uh, a lady who was killed in a car accident. I suppose that would have been last night. Um, that just, uh, that's heartbreaking and left, left behind children and a husband. Uh, so I know that we, we can pass along more details we find out, but that's something to keep in your prayers. We have, we have shuffled around the books of the month a lot lately. I realize that and it's, it's, it's that time of year, summer, a lot of being gone and things like that. But uh, if I'm not mistaken, this is June's book of the month. Uh, we, we are getting it here in the first of July, but we want to look at the book of Psalms. And uh, it, it, this, this was a tough one for me uh, because you're dealing with a lot of material. Even looking at it from an overview, uh, in an overview fashion, there's a lot of material to cover. And so I, I wrestle with how do I want to approach this, try to make it practical, uh, try to condense it as, as much as possible, and, and also how to arrange it. Uh, so hopefully in the next three or four hours we can cover this sufficiently to uh, <laughs> cover the book of Psalms. I'm just kidding. We're going we're gonna to crunch it in here as, as much as we possibly can. And uh, it'll be a very, very much of an overview. But uh, there, this is one of those books where you could really probably sum it up 
in one word if you just had to, worship, praise, uh, but, but there's a lot more that could be said as well. Let, let's talk about a few things, and as I said, I, I, tried, I tried to be practical, but also uh, make it as, uh, cover as much as we can in the time we have, I'll put it that way. Uh, let's talk about Hebrew poetry a little bit. We, we looked last month at Job, Job being the first book of what is, what is called poetry. We, we often refer to that section of scripture as poetry. The Hebrew poetry will match thought, not words. When we think of poetry, we think of matching words and uh, things like that, and oftentimes rhyming words. But with the, with the Israelites and, and Hebrew poetry, it was not about rhyming words or uh, matching words. It was matching thoughts. And really, I, I debated. This is one of those where I had to cut out some material. I wanted to talk about the different kinds of parallelism. This, this is what this is called when you match the thought. Uh, it, I wish we had more time, and, and maybe, in, maybe one of these days in a class or something when we study Proverbs or Psalms or uh, one of the books of poetry, we'll talk more about what parallelism is and the different kinds and things like that. But for now, we'll just suffice it to say, if you ever hear somebody talk about Hebrew parallelism, they're talking about Hebrew poetry, uh, this idea of matching thoughts and, and not words. Uh, there are a couple of different types of, uh, well, four different types of, of Hebrew poetry. There's lyric this would be what we're talking about when we talk about the Psalms. These are not always, but often, poems that were meant to be sung. Of course, under the Old Testament, they were authorized and commanded to use instruments, and so they would sing these with, with instruments many times. Uh, not always, but sometimes they did, and not every psalm was meant to be sung, uh, but many of them were. So you had lyric-type poetry. Uh, there was also didactic, teaching, in other words. This would be such books such as Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. They're, they're teaching poems that are designed to teach things to, as in the case many times in Proverbs, a, a man teaching his son. And not, not the entire book, but many of them, uh, many of those Proverbs, it's, it's a father instructing his son. Well, that's a type of Hebrew poetry. And then there's dramatic poetry. That would be like the book of Job. We talked about this last month, and the Song of Solomon is it, sort of, uh, poetry of drama. Things are going on and uh, it, it's, it's not to be mistaken that to say that Song of Solomon or Job are, are fiction. They're real life events, but it's, it's arranged in such a way such, so that it's dramatic poetry. Uh, much like uh, Julius Caesar, uh, you know, with, with uh, Shakespeare. You know, he, he took historical events, arranged them into a dramatic fashion and made a, wrote a play out of that. But only this was done by inspiration, of course, when you're talking scripture. And then you have po poetry that is of the lament, uh, lamenting variety. And this will be the book, of course, of Lamentations. And it's just poetry of sorrow. And we'll talk more about that when we get there. Next, just a few uh, miscellaneous items as it pertains to the Psalms. The, the Jews divided the Old Testament as, into three sections, the Law, the Prophets, and the Psalms. Psalms actually in, include an entire section. And this would include other forms of poetry besides just that one book, but it shows you how important the Psalms were to the Jews in, in, as far as their understanding of Scripture and how, how highly they regarded this book. Sometimes, I think, nowadays at least, Psalms almost gets pushed to the side. And we say, well, you know, I'll just read those here and there, spot, a spot here, spot there, hit and miss, so to speak. But it, they had a very high regard for this book, and, and rightly so. If you want to see Christianity in the everyday man's life, read, no, not Christianity, but God within the everyday man's life in the Old Testament, read the book of Psalms. And that's, that's where you see it. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not always a worship setting. It's not, a lot of times it's just an everyday Here's a person, they're sad, they're grieving over sin, they, they need help from God. They, you know, real life situations. But you see the elevated status that it has. Jesus in Luke 24, 44 mentioned this threefold division. All things must be fulfilled which were written to me concerning me in the law and the prophets and in the Psalms. Uh, so those were the, the divisions there, there's no other book that's quoted more when it comes to New Testament, uh, quoting from the Old Testament, than the book of Psalms. Now, some of that probably is due to the magnitude of the book. It's, it's the biggest, longest book in the Old Testament. Uh, it, it, is also, uh, it also contains the longest chapter that you'll find in all of Scripture. 
Psalm 119. It also contains the shortest chapter that you will find in all of Scripture, Psalm 117. Uh, it also, I'm told, I've never verified this, but I'm told it contains the midpoint of Scripture, which I believe is Psalm 118, somewhere in Psalm 118. Uh, we don't know exactly. There, this is not one of those where you can say, well, here's who wrote it or here's who we think wrote it. Uh, you know, there are a variety of authors for these different psalms, human authors. Again, understanding it's all by inspiration of the Spirit. Uh, these were compiled by different ones. It's, it's said that Hezekiah compiled a number during uh, the uh, pre-captivity period, just before going, just before uh, Judah went into captivity. Some were compiled. Of course, David wrote a number of them and, and no doubt compiled his psalms. But uh, some of these were just sort of collected as, as they went. But again, understanding God's divine preservation of his holy word but some of the authors that we read about David wrote some 73 psalms that we read about not only that then you have Solomon who wrote a couple of psalms David's son Psalm 72 Psalm 127 you have Asaph who wrote 12 of them sons of Korah wrote 12 Moses even has a psalm his probably would count as the oldest psalm Psalm 90 then you have others uh, you have this uh, fellow, Heman, Psalm 88, Psalm 89, written by Ephan, and then, of course, that famous author, Anonymous. <laughs> so, psalms that are not, we just don't have the, we don't have the author given, and that would be about 48 psalms. So different ones wrote different psalms. Some of them we don't even know. Some of them written by, uh, of course, David is the most famous because he wrote uh, more than anyone else. Another thing, let's, let's notice, uh, divisions of this book. There are five divisions, five books is the way some people uh, divide this. And, uh, I, you know, I don't re recall ever running across this, this statement until researching for this particular sermon. <clears throat> but I, I read numerous sources that said these were said by the Jews to correspond to the five books of the Law of Moses or the five books of the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Uh, not necessarily to correspond in content or anything like that, but just basically saying Moses gave us five books of the law. God, through Moses, gave us five books of law. We give him five books of praise in response to that law that he's given us. Uh, that's, that's sort of the way it's, it was intended, at least the way I understood it. But uh, book one is Psalms 1 through 41. Two is 42 through 72. 3 is 73 through 89, 4 is 90 through 106, and 5 is 107 through 150. By the way, this is one of those PowerPoints that uh, we're covering a lot and we're going quickly. Uh, this is one of those you may want to ask me for later if I move too quickly, and I know probably sometimes there's going to be times when maybe you want to write something down and I move too fast. Uh, I, I never mind sharing anything with you. If, it's, if the guy I got it from doesn't mind, I don't mind either. <laughs> but, uh, you know, there's no new thing under the sun, Solomon said, so I don't ever mind sharing something. If you ever found a situation with this sermon or any other for that matter, you say, well, I just didn't get that down. Uh, I, I really would like to go back and study that a little more in depth. Just ask. I'll be glad to share with you anything I've got. Each, each, book, of, uh, each book of these, or, or book of Psalms, uh, each section, if you want to call it that, has a similar ending. And you can, you can look at those uh, on your own and see that each, each ending has, has a very similar. It's kind of, it kind of ends with a, a doxology of praise to God. Now, I want to mention something here just quickly. We, we could really could talk about this a lot more. The titles of the Psalms. Sometimes people want to know, what about the titles? Or, or some people call them the inscriptions. Uh, for example, look, <clears throat> and by the way, some Bibles I just... Uh, my Bible has the books written. Does anybody see that in your Bible? It's at Psalm 1, do you have a book 1 above that? Uh, I do in mine. And so some, sometimes you'll have Bibles that do that. Now, my other Bible that I used in preacher school, the one that's falling apart and I keep in my Bible, I keep in my office, rather, just for reading, uh, it does not do that. So you don't have the books divided. But if you'll notice at Psalm 3, it says, A Psalm of David when he fled from Absalom his son. Well, how much stock can we put in that? You know, to the chief musician, Psalm 4, on Neganoth, a psalm of David. Uh, you, you see, that Psalm 7 sometimes gives you even a little more detail, which he sang, uh, Shigayon of David, which he sang unto the Lord concerning the words of Cush, the Benjamite. Sometimes it'll say a psalm of David when he fled from Saul or when he fled from Absalom. 
Uh, sometimes people ask about those. What about, are they inspired? Are they uninspired? Can we put a lot of stock in that? It, it's hard to say with 100% certainty. Uh, it is interesting, though, that the Hebrew text includes them in the text itself. <clears throat> if you remember from how we got the Bible, how meticulous the Masoretic scribes were with what they included as part of Scripture. Uh, these, uh, these inscriptions were part of the Hebrew text. That tells us they were held in very high esteem. Uh, they, they, seem, they, they, they seem to be characteristic of something that would be included uh, as, as far as being part of the inspired text. The New Testament seems to treat them as inspired. Mark 12, 35 through 37, I, I, I say seems to because what will happen is in Mark 12, Jesus is going to attribute a psalm to David. <clears throat> David calls him, how, how does David say, the Lord said to my Lord, sit thou on thy right hand till I make thy foes thy footstool? Well, in the text of the psalm itself, it never says this is David speaking. Jesus says, though, how does David say that? Now, that's, why, that's where it gets to the, the New Testament seems to indicate this, because Jesus would know the author either way. I mean, ultimately, he is the author. He is the word incarnate, John 1.1. 1, 1. Uh, you get to Acts chapter 2, verses 29 and following, and, and 34 and following. Uh, Peter's going to say, referencing, Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither shalt thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption. Uh, he's talking about David, and Peter says, you know, that scripture can't be about David, folks, is what he's basically saying to the men on the day of Pentecost, because David's dead, and his sepulchre is with us to this day. But again, he's attributing the psalm to David, whereas in the psalm itself, it never says it's David. Again, Peter speaking by inspiration, so he would know that David wrote that psalm. So uh, we, we, we don't know necessarily 100% for sure that that's the New Testament saying, telling us beyond a shadow of a doubt the inscriptions are inspired, but it sure seems that they are. I would say if someone were to pin me down and ask me about that, or, or can we trust the inscriptions as inspired, I would just say, I think so, <laughs> probably. We don't know that 100% for sure, but it sure seems that way. All right, let's talk about the seven main subjects of Psalms. You know, seven's often used in the Bible as completion or perfection, and it's interesting because you see seven main subjects uh, pop up within the book of Psalms. Number one, recognizing the everlasting, all-powerful, all-wise, ever-present, all-righteous nature of God. And you'll see several references there, and for time's sake, we just cannot go and look at all of them. I wish we could. But uh, we really would be here three or four hours if we did. But recognizing the nature of God, that he is the great I am. We sang just a moment ago, worship the king. That's, that's kind of the idea. By the way, I, I meant to put a note on this slide. Uh, this slide is almost verbatim from uh, Frank Dunn, the Know Your Bible book. So just to give credit where credit is due there. Number two subject that you see prominent in the book of Psalms is praising God's infinite love, his providence, his goodness. Over and over again you see this. And, and these, you know, you see, I'll, I'll put some references here. Again, th these are coming from Brother Dunn. You know, but th these are just a few out of many that you could pick out of the entire book. Praising God's infinite love, providence, and goodness. Rebuking all forms of idolatry. Psalms is very hard on idolatry, as is all of Scripture. But it, it shows the, the foolishness. In fact, uh, that, that text there in Psalm 106, 36 through 38 is especially uh, appropriate when you're dealing with idols, how foolish it is. They have mouths, but they can't speak. They have ears, but they can't, uh, they can't hear. They're, they're worthless. You, you carve out an idol, and then you fall, you, you're the one who carves it out, and then you fall before it and worship it? That doesn't make sense. And so the Psalms deals very strongly with idolatry in every form. Another thing we see is giving prophetic glimpses of Christ and his redeeming work here on this earth. And we'll see, just, we'll look at those just very, very briefly in a little while, Lord willing. And, and then uh, showing the terrible nature of sin. That's another theme in the Psalms. Also shows how God hates sin. He loves his creation, people, but he hates sin. And also his judgment upon sinners. He cannot put up with it. Sin has to be dealt with. It has to be judged Number six, I believe it says, teaching divine mercy and forgiveness. God is a merciful God, slow to anger, slow to wrath. He's eager to forgive. That's taught over and over again in the book of Psalms. And number seven, emphasizing the duty of man to repent and to obey God. That is our responsibility. When we realize we are in sin, we need to repent, turn to God, obey him, follow him faithfully all of our days. By the way, I didn't mention this earlier. 
Psalm 1 serves as basically an introduction to the book. I mean, this basically tells you what the book is going to be about. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And, of course, he goes on and talks about the blessings for a fellow like that, the ungodly are not so. And then he sums it all up and says, For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. That's just, it's almost like a microcosm of the book itself, right there in Psalm 1. Let's move on here and talk about the different kinds of psalms. You'll, you'll see several different kinds of psalms within this book. And, and here we, we will pause and look at just one or two of these, uh, bearing in mind that we have to move quickly. <clears throat> there, is, there are alphabetic or acrostic psalms, such as Psalm 119. That's probably the most famous one. Uh, I'm trying to remember if this Bible has them. I don't think it does. Um, this Bible that I have, this edition, it's a King James Version, but it's, uh, there are different editions of the King James Version. It actually has the Hebrew letter written out. Uh, Psalm 119, uh, the verse, before verse 1, I've got Aleph, and then Beth, and so on and so forth. In my other Bible that I keep in my office, it actually has the, uh, I think it has the Hebrew, the symbol of that letter. Different Bibles do it different way, different editions do it different way. But anyway, this is an alphabetic psalm. It, it, each section begins with a certain letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and, and it goes right down through the alphabet all the way through Psalm 119 as it uh, magnifies and glorifies God's Word. There are several psalms that are that way. You see on the uh, PowerPoint there, Psalm 9, Psalm 10, and others as well. Then there are ethical psalms. Uh, these teach moral and ethical principles. They're, they're teaching uh, what God expects of his people. A good example of this, uh, if I can get over there, is Psalm 15. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, neighbor nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor, in whose eyes a vile person is condemned, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. He that putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent. He that doeth these things shall never be moved. Teaching who is acceptable in the sight of God. So you see why we say it's, a, it's a, an ethical type psalm. It's dealing with ethical principles. Then there are what we call the hallelujah psalms. These begin and or end with the phrase praise the Lord or praise ye the Lord. Something to that effect. Psalm 106, Psalm 11, Psalm 112, good examples of those. Uh, on and on uh, we could go looking at hallelujah psalms. And some of these overlap, by the way, you'll notice that. Uh, some, some are acrostic psalms, but also hallelujah psalms, things like that. There are historical psalms. <clears throat> these recount Israel's history. Uh, you have an example of this, in Psalm 78, Psalm 105, Psalm 106, sometimes even going way back into Israel's history, and sometimes you have a longer psalm because it's giving a detailed account of history. Uh, they, they certainly had uh, a number of those. Then you have what we call imprecatory psalms. These give people trouble sometimes because these are psalms that invoke evil upon one's enemies, not moral evil, but calamity. It's praying for judgment. Sometimes you'll have David or someone who's saying, Lord, reward them. Give them the fruit of their works. Things like that. Uh, destroy those who would seek to do harm to your people. Things like that. They, they, we might could even say they're a curse upon the enemies of God's people and of God himself. Psalm 69 is a good example of that. Sometimes people, they, they really struggle with this, and, and, and they say, I just don't know, I don't know how, how, this could, how this can be, you know, that this is inspired scripture, someone asking God to, to come and do that. I really like what, I, I wish I could tell you who, who said this. I found a last name, and that's all I could find for this quote, and his, the last name was Yoder, I believe. And here's, here's what he said, and I, I'm not, I'm, I didn't write this down, so I don't know if I'm quoting him exactly right, but he said, perhaps... If we studied and understood more the nature, the seriousness of sin, we wouldn't have such a hard time with imprecatory psalms. If we understood how strongly God feels about sin, how he cannot fellowship it, he cannot abide in the presence of it, 
then maybe we might understand that. This is not some, someone who's just mad and wants revenge when you have an imprecatory psalm. This is not somebody who, uh, you know, some, like sometimes children will get mad at siblings and they fuss and one of them hits the other and they haul off and I'm going to hit them right back. That's, that's not what's going on. This is a servant of God who understands someone has sinned. They are attacking God's people, which we learn from Saul of Tarsus is the same as attacking God himself. Sometimes they are speaking blasphemy against God, and it's one who is praying to God, and he's saying, God, reward them according to their deeds. You remember Paul in 2 Timothy 4 talking about it, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord rewarded him according to his works. He didn't want to see Alexander the coppersmith lost. He just said, if he's not going to repent, then God keep him from, my prayer is that he would be kept from harming anyone else. And so we, we, we need not worry too much about those because when we, when we begin to understand the nature of sin, then it makes a lot more sense to us. There are messianic psalms. Boy, there, there are a lot of these in the psalms. And I, I think one of the best examples, obviously you can't look at very many of these, but look at, look at Psalm 2. And especially the latter part of the psalm. Serve the Lord with fear, verse 11. Rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry. The idea of kiss, to kiss toward. Literally, that's a literal translation of worship when you get to the Greek. Uh, it, the word that we have translated worship, it could literally be translated to kiss toward. Uh, and that's the idea of prostrating oneself, kissing toward, to worship. So worship the son, lest he be angry and you perish from the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. You turn over just a little bit to Psalm 22. The famous statement, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Go over a, a little ways to, uh, go, going over to Psalm 110. That's what is quoted from, we noticed just a little moment ago with Mark chapter 12. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at, thy, at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Hebrews writer quotes from this psalm as well. Look at verse 4. The Lord has sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. All in all, we could go looking at messianic psalms. Some, sometimes an entire psalm is messianic. Sometimes you have a messianic statement just put right there in, in a psalm. But there's a lot of foreshadowing of the Christ within the psalms. Then there are penitential psalms. These are sorrow psalms showing a great deal of sorrow over sin. We'll, we'll look at Psalm 51 a little bit more in depth in just a moment. There are songs of ascent. These are sometimes called songs of degrees. You'll sometimes see that in the inscription of a psalm. It'll say a song of, a, a song of degrees or a psalm of degrees or something like that. Uh, these are songs that, psalms that were sung on the way up to Jerusalem, on the way up to the temple to worship. You know, the Jews presented themselves before the Lord three times a year. They would go to Jerusalem and many times they would sing together on the way. And they would sing these psalms. Psalm 120, Psalm 134, and others are examples of that. There are psalms of suffering, pointing out how they suffered, sometimes asking God for help for relief from suffering. Psalm 6 is a good example of, of such a psalm. And then there are psalms of, of thanksgiving. You, you can look at Psalm uh, 118, that's, uh, that's the, uh, that is it. I was saying a while ago, I was thinking this was the middle verse of the Bible, at least what I'm told. It's Psalm 118, verse 8. Uh, and, and it's interesting because the middle verse of the Bible says it is better to put trust, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. But Psalm 118 is a good example of a psalm of thanksgiving. Uh, psalm 117, the shortest psalm, the shortest chapter of any in the Bible, might be another good example of sort of a psalm of Thanksgiving, 136 is another one, and others that we could go on. I want to notice something next, the, some lessons from Psalms. I, I, I don't have very many of these. I, you could really go, I mean, preach series upon series of lessons that we learn from the book of Psalms. And so this is where I really, really tried to force myself to pare it down and look at just a few. And one thing we're going to notice is that the Psalms teach us a lot about God himself. Let me, let me check something here before I say this. I want to make sure I've got it right. Turn with me to Psalm 148. 
Before I get to this next point, I'm going to give uh, Brother Todd back there a chance to switch over to the songbook. What's that, what's that number, Brother Steve? 70. Turn to number 70 in your songbook. Let me double check. I'm going to cheat and look at my note here. I just keep, I'm, I'm, keep thinking I've got it wrong. Okay, it is Psalm 148. Uh, read Psalm 48 with me. Brother Steve's going to come and, and lead us in this song, Hallelujah, Praise Jehovah, which is taken directly from Psalm 148. And you think about this. You think about, we're going to notice in just a moment how the Psalms teach us about God. We learn a lot about God himself from the book of Psalms. Look at 148. Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise ye him, all his angels. Praise ye him, all his hosts. Praise ye him, sun and moon. Praise him, all ye stars of light. Praise him, ye heavens of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded, and they were created. He hath also established them forever and ever. He hath made a decree which shall not pass. Praise the Lord from the earth, ye dragons and all deeps. Fire and hail, snow and vapor, stormy wind fulfilling his word. Mountains and all hills, fruitful trees and all cedars, beasts and all cattle, creeping things and flying fowl, kings of the earth and all people, princes and all judges of the earth, both young men and maidens, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is excellent. His glory is above the earth and heaven. He also exalted the horn of his people, the praise of all his saints, even of the children of Israel, a people near unto him, praise ye the Lord. When you look at the American Standard 1901, it's even closer than that to a direct quote when we sing the psalm. But think about the words of that psalm as Brother Steve comes down and leads us in this song.
Appreciate Brother Steve doing that. That is a wonderful song. And again, coming directly from Psalm 148, teaching us about God and there are number of number of things we learn about God from the Psalms. And I'm trying to I'm trying to uh, monitor my time here because there's certain <laughs> there's a couple things I wanted to talk about a little bit more. Psalm tells us Psalms tells us a lot about God. I'm going to go through these quickly, and if you want this uh, again, p please feel free to ask me. But I'm going to go through this quickly. I'd hope to have time to cover some of these verses, but uh, I, I want to spend a little bit more time on something else in just a moment. Uh, they the Psalms teach us about God's eternality. He's always been there. He always will be. That's why we call him the Great I Am. He's not the I was. He's not the I will be. He is the I Am. We learn about his eternality. We learn about his omnipresence. Psalm 139 is, is the text. We've, we've looked at it before where David says, Whither shall I go from thy presence? Whither shall I flee from thy spirit? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, she hold the grave. Behold, thou art there. I cannot go anywhere to escape God's presence because he is everywhere. He's omnipresent. His omniscience. There's nothing he doesn't know. The first part of Psalm 139 tells us that. There, you, you can keep no secret from God because he knows all. Also his omnipotence, the fact that he is all powerful. You cannot overpower God. You can be the United States government, you can be the United States Supreme Court. You go against God, you lose every single time. Ask Rome, ask Nebuchadnezzar, ask many other world leaders throughout all time. They learned it the hard way. You don't win against God. He is omnipotent. His changelessness, he doesn't change. In, in Hebrews 13, it says, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. We see that same theme pointed out in the, in the Psalms. 102, 26, and 27 is a good example of that. Also, his righteousness. God is, he's right. Genesis 18, 25, Abraham put it this way. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? God will always do what is right. What a, what a great thing to know that we're in his hands for judgment, and he will always do what's right. Not just that, but we learn about his mercy, his protection, his benevolence. I love Psalm 68, verse 19. Blessed be the Lord God, which daily loadeth us with benefits, even the God of our salvation. God loads us down with benefits. The glory of his word. Man, we could study for weeks on Psalm 119. It's all about the Word of God. I counted it one time. I, 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 didn't, I didn't take the time to go back this time and count. But one time I actually went through Psalm 119 and counted. And I believe I could count. It was either on one hand, definitely less than two hands, the number of verses that don't say anything about the Word of God in some form or another. Uh, just, it's just that replete with study and glorif glorification of the Word of God. But also His works. You see Psalm, 1, Psalm 19 verses 7 through 11, in the first part of Psalm 19, it talks about the work of God. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. That's general revelation. And then when he gets to verse 7, he, sh he shifts to specific revelation, talking about the word of God. Boy, I wish we had more time to talk about those things. Psalms tells us a lot about God himself, but here, here's the thing. I don't think I ever really gave much thought to this, studying the Psalms before. I mean, I, I went through this this afternoon, and I uh, just wanted to look at my preaching school notes, and, you know, looking at the notes that I took, I, 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 it's hard to remember. That's been so many years ago, but <clears throat> it's, I suppose I thought of it as another class, you know. You got to get through, you know, this, this is, sometimes we, we fall into that trap when you're in a situation like that. I've, uh, I, I'm, I'm counting down the days till graduation, but here's something that I never gave thought to, and I, I wish I could tell you where I first ran across this in my research for this particular sermon. But don't ever forget this lesson. If you don't remember anything else from this tonight, remember this, that the, the, I think one of the greatest lessons of Psalms is seeing people like David, Solomon, Moses, other folks, they, they make God, they make God's word, they, they make religion itself a part of their everyday lives. It's not about when they're just at worship or when they're at Bible study or you know synagogue service for the Jews, whatever. It's not just about putting on a different face when they're there. It is about imbibing God's truth and making it a part of every single day of their lives, good times and bad. 
You, you see this in the Psalms, heartfelt words of men who they just trust in God. And sometimes they're just crying out from the heart, God, help me. Don't lose that when you study the Psalms. God's ever their companion, their rock, their help. Psalm 46, verse 1, you have David crying out, Look, God is my refuge, very present help in trouble. Where am I going to go when I'm in trouble, when I need help? He says, I'm going to God. God is my refuge. Just, it's so easy to overlook that as we study it. And like I said, I don't think I'd ever paid much attention to this until studying for this particular lesson. And it's powerful. I think that is one of the most powerful lessons for us to take away from this book. These are everyday people. And God is a part of their lives every single day. This is not the work of a scholar or theologians. These aren't people as seminary students or how, you know, the, one, one fellow said you go into cemetery school, huh? Uh, th these are not theologians or scholars. These are just everyday people. They love God. They're not perfect. Sometimes they, they pray to God for forgiveness. Who could forget Psalm 23? A lot, of, a lot of folks speculate, and I, I tend to agree, that this was written later in David's life as he reflects back on his early years, and he says, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. That's just a man who's, who's reflecting on how good God has been to him throughout his life. We've studied right here in, 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 our, uh, in a worship setting, We've studied Psalm 29. I don't know if you remember it or not, but, you know, he says, Give unto the Lord, O you mighty. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. And then he goes on, he talks about worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. It's a part of their everyday lives. And, of course, we mentioned Psalm 46, 1. We mentioned Psalm 51 that we'll notice. And that brings us to this. I want to notice, we've already sung one song from Psalm 148. We actually sung another one earlier, The Lord's My Shepherd. That's from Psalm 23. Just think about how many songs come from, either directly from or inspired from, one of the psalms. We sang that one just a moment ago. There's a song called Shelter in the Time of Storm. If you, if you look at Psalm 61 and verse 3, if I can get over there, I'll read that one. Psalm 61, verse 3. For thou hast been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. God is our shelter in the time of a storm. Not only that, the song we just sang, Hallelujah, Praise Jehovah, I'll fly away. If you look at Psalm 90, verse 10, notice what the psalmist here says. Psalm 90, verse 10. The days of our years are threescore years and ten, and if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, eighty, yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off, and we fly away. But what a great thought to know that now, several thousand years past when, when that was written, that here we are, and we could say, we, we do fly away, but as we sing the song, I'm going to fly away to heaven. I know I have heaven as my home. Other examples we could give, flee as a bird. That song comes from Psalm 11, verse 1. Unto the hill, Psalm 121, verse 1. And then, oh, praise the Lord, comes from Psalm 117. Several of these uh, or what we might call, I, I don't even like the, the terminology. Sometimes people will call them devotional songs or camp songs. Uh, and, and, and what sometimes happens is we, when we use that distinction, people start thinking, I don't know about these, uh, you know, these songs. And what they are is they're songs of praise. They're songs of worship, the same as any other. I've, I've, I've run across situations where uh, well-meaning elders, well-meaning folks would say, uh, we're not going to sing any of those camp songs around here. And I say, have you read some of those camp songs? Because some of them are direct quotes from the Psalms and other scriptures. I'm, I'm for making sure singing is scriptural. I'm, I'm as much on that as anybody. But let's, let's be careful that we don't, just because something is new, assume that it's bad. But here's an example. Come, let us sing, Psalm 95. It, it, this, this is one of those that's almost a direct quote. Psalm 95 uh, verses 1 through 5, he says, Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his, and he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Now, if you've ever been 
Bible camp where we've sung that, you know that song and you recognize it's almost word for word from Psalm 95, 1 through 5. Now, if you don't know it, then, well, 13 of our young folks, you're probably going to know it after this week because uh, we typically will sing that one at uh, Camp McCroy. I can't remember if we sing it at Inagahi or not. Unto thee, O Lord, is another one. Psalm 25, turn over there and take a look at this one. Uh, Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul, he says there in Psalm 25, verse 1. Verse 2, O my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let not mine enemies triumph over me. I know we sing this one at Camp in Gehi. Yea, let none that wait on thee be ashamed. Let them be ashamed which transgress without cause. It's so hard to say some of these and read them without singing. Verse 7, he says, Remember not the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions. According to thy mercy, remember thou me for thy goodness sake, O Lord. Another one that we sing many times at camp. I will call upon the Lord. Psalm 18. Turn back. It's just, just a page in my Bible. Psalm 18. Well, I've got to go back a little more than that. Verse 3. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. And you drop down to verse 46. And he says, The Lord liveth. And blessed be my rock. And let the God of my salvation be exalted. Again, that song is a direct quote from those two verses. There's the song, As the Deer. Look at Psalm 42, the first two verses of that psalm. Notice what he says, As the heart, and that's just another word for a deer, panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. Here's a man in everyday life, and he says, I'm not just going, do we got to go to church today? He says, I long, I long to be in the presence of God. My soul thirsteth for God, verse 2, for the living God, when shall I come and appear before God? You think God wasn't important to these people? They're just like you and me. Another song that we often sing, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Direct quote from Psalm 119, 105. Be still and know that I am God. Psalm 46, verse 10. We sing that song. I don't believe, I don't recall ever singing that one in Inagahi, but that's one I'm almost for sure we will sing uh, this, this week at Camp McCroy. 10,000 reasons. I didn't know this one until recently, and I, it may have been in Agahi where I learned this one, but it's also, some people call it, Bless the Lord, O My Soul. This is from Psalm 103. Really, this, this is one of the psalms, but there are actually a, a few psalms that, that say this, but some of the thoughts within the lyrics uh, seem to be derived from Psalm 103. Verse 1, he says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Again, just a part of their everyday lives. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Psalm 51, that's David's prayer. He begs God. He knows he sinned. This is when he committed that sin with Bathsheba. He's been confronted by the prophet and told, Thou art the man. And he says, I need to get my life right with the Lord. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. There's so much more we could say. But as we close, think about that last lesson. Are the, psalm, are, the, are the psalms, the word of God, God himself, the church of Jesus Christ, is it a part of my everyday life? Are you a Christian? Maybe you need to come and, as a penitent believer, confess Christ as Lord and be baptized into Christ, have your sins washed away and added by the Lord to his church. Maybe you need to come back and make that a part of every single day of your life. Good times, bad times, everything in between. God is our refuge. God is our strength, a very present help in trouble. Maybe you just need prayers for strength. Heaven's invitation is extended. However way we can help you in following God and going to heaven, won't you let us know as we stand and sing. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. Abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust.
Thank you, Chad, for that fine lesson on Psalms. I know that's a lot of preparation, and certainly the Bible is very rich, and we just scratched the surface tonight. You could have been up here for a long time, I know, but we're thankful for the effort and the presentation this evening, and especially if you're visiting with us, invite you back at your next opportunity. We're so happy that you're here with us tonight. Please take a moment and fill out an attendance card if you were not here this morning. Leave that with one of us as you depart so that we may have a record of your visit with us. Remind you of those on our prayer list. We have an update on Brother Frank. He is uh, now in room uh, G252 at Emory. Hooper and Mary Sue went to see him this afternoon, and they got to spend some time with Frank and Lola. We're hopeful that he can come to the Oaks facility where Sister Frida is sometime this week. Probably not tomorrow, but maybe Tuesday is the latest word that we have at this time. You're also asked to remember uh, Janice Jones. She's continuing in room 160 at Tanner. She's hopeful of getting out soon. She's kind of been on a roller coaster of late with her blood pressure, we understand, but we're hopeful that she can get out of the hospital soon as well. You're also asked to remember Al as he has gone through some treatment and is continuing at home. You asked to also remember Sister Frida Gray as she continues at the Oaks. James Meadows, a former director of the East Tennessee School of Preaching, is suffering from cancer and requests our prayer. Jimmy Nolan's wife, Sandy, we're glad to report, is now home from the hospital and doing better. She's still not out of the woods yet, but you're asked to continue to remember her, but at least she's out of the hospital. Florine King, we understand, is continuing her slow progress at home. You're also asked to remember her. Louis Smith has a doctor's appointment tomorrow for some treatment uh, upcoming. I also solicit your prayers. I will depart uh, this coming Friday for mission trip in Costa Rica, be down there for a little over a week. Also in the foyer, we have some flyers to advertising our VBS meeting. They look like, whoop, here it is. They look like that. So they're out there on that table in the foyer. If you want to grab some of those and distribute those amongst your family and friends and maybe some business owners that would allow you to put it in their window. Our VBS is continuing or will be uh, upon us uh, in two weeks. Two weeks from today, the 19th of July, we'll begin uh, kickoff VBS with our annual uh, balloon liftoff and ice cream supper. That'll be after the evening service. We'll have evening worship VBS services each evening, Monday through Friday, beginning at 630 classes for all ages. We'll have auditorium classes for the adults as well. Again, the topic being heroes of faith, and we're looking forward to that. Do we still need some boxes, Jimmy, or we got that taken care of? If you have uh, access to some medium-sized boxes, we have a need for this. We're not going to tell you exactly what it is because it's going to be somewhat of a surprise, but if you have some medium-sized boxes that you can bring, we'll need that for one of the props that we're looking forward to uh, in the decoration that we'll have for VBS. So if you have that, access to that, bring some of those as well. You're also asked to remember the shoe drive. There's a flyer on the, on the uh, uh, bulletin board here in the hallway concerning the shoe drive. We've got about another five weeks to collect those, and then Brother Sidney will come and get those and send them to where they need to go for the benefit of this young man, Andrew Sanders. Also, we mentioned this morning our newspaper campaign. If you want to read the ad that was in this most recent uh, Times Georgian episode, which I think was, was it Thursday? I think it was on Thursday. There's a copy of it on the bulletin board here in the hallway. We'll have the next ad that'll be a quarter page size this coming Sunday, a week from today. So again, we're asking you to uh, be prayerful for our campaign. And again, it's uh, purpose of this is to try to take advantage of the sentiment that a lot of folks seem to have of the nation's direction not going the way we want it to. We're trying to take advantage of that to get folks to understand that we uh, can certainly help provide some direction if they will um, take our advice and hopefully we can get some benefit lasting out of this effort. Last the leaders will have a junior scrapbook meeting uh, next Sunday at 5 p.m. grades K through fifth grade. 
Also in connection with VBS, if the adults want to sign up for a t-shirt, there's a sign up list in the foyer. Also some of the items that we need, two liter drinks, some snacks, cookies, that kind of thing, bring those and put them in the kitchen for our VBS effort. The Brethren of Waco will have a one day VBS Saturday, July the 18th. Lord's Supper is kept prepared for those that wish to observe it. Once we stand to sing, go through this door, second door on the left, and there will be someone there waiting to serve you. Again, our summer series continues this Wednesday. Brother Patrick Gray will be here, Lord willing, speaking about the parting of the Red Sea. Final song, brother. 406, I'll Fly Away, will be our final song. If there's nothing else, feel Sam will sing and be dismissed. Sing the first verse. Some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. I'll fly Father, we thank you for this day and all the many blessings that you so richly bless us with. Thank you for this opportunity we've had to study that word. Pray that everything's been said and done. It's been pleasing, except on my sight. Pray, Heavenly Father, you bless all who are in need of prayer at this time, especially those who have been mentioned in announcements. Pray, Heavenly Father, you'll be with those that are traveling out of town and overseas this week. Keep them safe and from harm's way and return them safely home if it be thy will. Pray, Heavenly Father, you will forgive us of our sins. Pray we will put our faith, our hope, trust, and obedience in thy will. And I pray, Heavenly Father, you'll help us stop blending in and trying to fit in to the world. Keep us in the hall of thy hand and pray we'll put our faith, hope, and trust in thee and be a disciple of Christ each and every day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.